Hey there, nerds, and welcome to another installment of Your Brain on Crack. I'm the guy that wore a green shirt to my green screen show. Because, you know, after 60 episodes of this, I'm worse than ever. And Dave said I should take the shirt off, which I'm pretty sure means that I'm gonna win a lawsuit soon. So let's talk about movies. enough films out there so actively shitty, a movie proctologist could probably get rich enough to become a movie gynecologist. I failed you. You trusted me. But we're not talking about those movies. We're talking about movies that redeem themselves with one little scene that makes me forgive the rest of the admittedly not that great film. Did you enjoy the plot of the third X-Men movie? Trick question, goof butt. The correct answer is which one? Because there are actually three of them depending on how you solve for X. It's so convoluted that even one of those third movies, Gene Roddenberry's The Last Stand, is in and of itself two different movies clumsily stapled together like Deadpool's lips. I'm touching myself tonight. One is an action flick about the alternative murderous personality of Jean Grey called The Phoenix that takes over her mind and goes all psychic psychopath on the human population but the second movie deals with a cure that suppresses the X gene, offering mutants a chance at a normal life, forcing many to thoughtfully consider if that's something they might want for themselves. No, but it's not really a tough choice. If your name is Bobby Lobster Penis, take the cure. If your name is Wendy Literally Poops Cupcakes, well, you know, don't take it. <laughs> Now you could technically make a complex, deeply emotional X-Men film out of that story, all about identity and how people's expectations of who you should be can either build you up or tear you down if you want to be a freaking nerd. Well, The Last Stand kind of did make that movie. It just kept it very short, like one minute long short. An early scene establishes that the inventor of the mutant cure began researching it because his son Warren, the future X-Man Angel, developed a mutation that caused him to grow a freaking wing. Ha <laughs> you f Bad. Now, this could have been a very simple and forgettable sequence meant to quickly establish the film's secondary villain, but The Last Stand creates a memorable, poignant moment by having the man walk in on his son trying to literally hack the mutation off his back. Look at that kid's face. That is the face of pure suffering. This isn't some spur-of-the-moment decision for Warren. He's prepared a stack of bandages and a whole toolbox full of sharp objects like knives, razors, scissors. John C. <laughs> He's obviously been planning this for a really long time. Why? Because he is terrified of his father, who's a rampaging mutant racist, a mutinist, a speciest, Atlantis. No, oh, that's where Jason Mimosa lives. It's not real. I hear you can f the fish. It turns out Warren actually has his dad pretty well figured out too, because when he walks in on his child horrifically cutting himself with blood all over the floor, he says, ah, God, not you. Parenting tip. If you find your child disfiguring themselves, the first words out of your stupid mouth shouldn't boil down to how could you do this to me? You don't even think to call me Godfather. That's what X-Men 3 could have been, an identity drama, but with lasers. Pew, pew, pew. Pew, pew, pew. They flirt with it again when Rogue gives up her powers, but how hard is it to give up murdering everybody you touch? It was an accident. Angel's mutation is like my penis, harmless and gorgeous. Uh, uh, uh. And yet he was willing to butcher it because his dad's anti-mutant bigotry poisoned his mind. That is a powerful theme to explore, and it almost makes me forgive the movie for wasting so much screen time on forgettable characters like Sonic the Hedgeman Hog, or Spit Curl Girl, or Thank God Resumes No Longer Require Photos, Woman. <laughs> Get this out of the way. I used to scream at night remembering this scene, but God's silence? It was too definite. Besides Spider-Man's corruption, apparently mostly just resulting in him dancing on the street after discovering my chemical romance, but also ragtime music, I guess. When I f my father. One of the biggest problems with Spider-Man 3 is Sandman, a supposedly sympathetic villain driven to crime to get money for his sick daughter. Sounds great. Perfect amounts of conflictedness. So why have him retroactively be Uncle Ben's killer? And uh, why show him punching a dog? Look, no matter how much you love your kid, punching dogs is like the universal shorthand for, hey, look at me, I'm an expired bag of dicks. I understand. 
I assume Sam Raimi just came up with an idea for a moving and touching scene of Sandman's birth and then got distracted by a dead lizard in his garden and forgot to write, you know, the rest of the movie. But that origin is actually pretty great. I mean, after breaking out of prison, Flint Marco stumbles into a research facility that apparently specializes in shooting magic science or random crap to see what happens because these are fantasy movies where researchers get tons of money to just nerd out on passion projects instead of, you know, making another pill that costs a billion dollars per capsule. Double the money. Unfortunately for Flint, the scientists are experimenting with sand, as one does, and his molecules become fused with the thing's dandruff, as one does. I don't. When Flint regains consciousness and awakens as a pile of sentient sand, his realization of what happened to him is conveyed entirely through music and visuals and is nothing short of beautiful. Marco's sprinkled remains coalesce into a blob-like mass of silica, slowly forming a mangled humanoid figure. Marco is confused at what he's become, apparently a grotesque sand mannequin with a featureless face and sand oven mitts for hands, because it's like, he could get stuff out of the oven a lot easier, but like, at what cost? What did it cost you, Flint. Everything. That's when Flint notices the locket with his daughter's picture inside, a physical link to his past life. He reaches out for it, only to see a sandy hand go, I don't feel so good, Mr. Stark, and disintegrate. I don't like sand. Flint summons all of his willpower, concentrates on the love for his daughter, and reaches for the locket again, but this time, managing to create a firm, human-like hand. I'm touching myself tonight. He picks himself up and regains his human form, thus completing one of the greatest villain origins ever put to film. Hunka hunka! It's fascinating how different in tone this emotional, dialogueless scene is from everything else in Spider-Man 3, which can most charitably be described as a movie. Most modern superhero movies can play in the background and you only need snippets of dialogue to keep up, but the birth of Sandman demands that you shut up and look at it, and in return, it shows you something spectacular. <laughs> and I personally applaud it for that. Oh, uh, remind me to get a new water cooler. Hire a new intern. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Welcome to Where the Magic Happens. When I'm making a video that I haven't even started on yet, I usually need to watch a lot of movies, right? But the problem is that even streaming services that I've signed up for don't always have the movies that I need, even when I know they're available somewhere. But that's where NordVPN comes in. See, I could talk about how great NordVPN is with its, you know, servers in 59 countries and all the nerd shit they do to protect your identity and keep you anonymous online and say and all that crap, and that's great. But what I really like it for is the fact that it lets me watch these movies on the streaming services I already have by switching my IP address's country of origin. For example, I needed to watch Zombieland again for this video, and uh, it's not on American Netflix. So what I did was I switched it to Brazil using NordVPN, and voila, there it is. I'm watching Zombieland. Everybody wins. And all you gotta do to get the most out of your subscriptions to Netflix or whatever you're signed up for is go to nordvpn.com slash literally and sign up. This deal is 30 days risk-free, so if you hate it, just, you know, cancel your subscription after 30 days. You've lost no money, and maybe you've gotten to watch Zombieland a couple extra times. Again, just go to nordvpn.com slash literally and sign up today. Plus, it kind of just helps the show. And sometimes we need help, right? When director Ong Lee started work on a story about the unjolly green giant, he knew that he needed to dig deep to find the real drama behind the character. Then he changed his mind and went with Crazy Nick Nolte running around being, you know, a Crazy Nick Nolte for two hours. Also, radioactive monster poodles. Watch out, Hulk! They're hypoallergenic! Yeah. The sad part is that underneath all of that movie's poodles, there actually is a really good story about the source of Bruce Banner's anger, his disturbing childhood trauma. According to the movie, Hulk was created after his father David tested a super vaccine by blasting a bunch of syringe science into his pH dick before firing up into his wife's uterus where, you know, pre-Hulk baby Bruce. Stop me if I'm using too much technical medical jargon. Stop! Stop! What? In any case, fearing that he'd created a monster, David Banner tries to stab his son but kills his wife in the process, mentally scarring Bruce for life. However, while childhood trauma is more standard superhero equipment than bright, somehow genitalia obscuring tights, Hulk gives us a twist on the formula, not on the genitals. 
David Banner was experimenting exclusively on himself because he wanted to save soldiers' lives. And when he finds out what he's done to his son, he first tries to fix it, eventually only going crazy after his continual failures exacerbate his guilt to impossible levels. And as a fellow doctor with superpowers, I can sympathize with that, even if I personally have held it together and didn't let my superpowers drive me crazy and evil, which surely deserves some self-congratulatory applause, so, <laughs> oh God. Dave, add a barrel of kittens to the list. Anyway, David's villain transformation is slow and subtle, and like recycling, it starts at home. Which is why I never recycle. Seems like a slippery slope. And there are signs, even before Bruce's birth, that David wasn't exactly a saint. When Bruce's mother first tells her husband that she's pregnant, she does it like she's confessing to totaling the car while backing out of her lover's driveway. I'm gonna have a baby. She's clearly terrified of the man, and you can look at the scene as evidence of there being domestic abuse in the Banner household. This is such a believably tragic origin, you might as well call the resulting character the Credible Hulk. Dave? Dave? <laughs>